One of the most common questions that I get asked from you guys is how to pick the best parts for your next gaming PC. Get the part selection process right and you'll have a well-balanced build that provides strong performance and minimizes bottlenecking. Get it wrong and you could be leaving all important performance on the table. So in today's video, I'm going to guide you through how I pick the parts for all of my builds to make your next build that little bit easier. Let's do this. Now it's no secret that the best place to start with a gaming PC is with the CPU and GPU combo. This is the area you want to allocate as much budget as possible. Typically, I'd recommend spending about half of your build budget on this pairing. Now if you're going for a really high-end build with a super high-end cooler and expensive case, this percentage is going to drop. But for those of you shopping on a $1,200 to $2,000 budget, 50% is about right. If you're on the real budget end of the market, you might be closer to that 40% margin. Now when it comes to CPUs, you've got two brands to choose from, AMD and Intel. Now this is actually really easy because AMD are presently better in pretty much every setting and criteria. Intel tend to have slightly better options for those who need lots of cores, video editing, rendering, that kind of stuff. But for gaming, AMD is where you're going to be. They've got a couple of generations out right now. Ryzen 7000 and Ryzen 9000 are the main two you should concern yourself with. And there isn't a great deal of difference between either. Both use the same socket, support the same motherboards, and the same standard of memory. Ryzen 9000 is newer and slightly faster, but there is a bargain to be had with some Ryzen 7000 chips too. AMD also have their X3D lineup, which you should look at if you're building a high-end system. These chips have lots of L3 cache that's actually stacked, hence the 3D name on the end there, and that's going to be great for those higher-end builds. It's worth noting that CPUs haven't really kept up with GPUs in the last few years, meaning CPU bottlenecks are more common than ever. A bottleneck is when you've got one component that holds another component back and slows down your system. Now, believe it or not, every system has one, otherwise you'd have unlimited performance. However, in the instance of your CPU, you're more likely to see a CPU bottleneck at lower resolutions. The higher res, you're going to see more of a GPU bound bottleneck as this component will have to work harder. So keep that in mind again, if you want a game at 1080p, super, super high frame rates, you have to spend more money on the CPU than if you were going to game at 4K on the same graphics card to get that optimal performance. GPUs are a little more complicated because there's actually three choices right now, AMD, Nvidia, and Intel. And unlike CPUs where things are more clear cut, GPU is more of a personal preference. Plus to complicate matters, we're currently in the midst of a big refresh in terms of new models. So here's what you need to know about the graphics card. Now the biggest manufacturer for GPUs is Nvidia. They have the lion's share of the market share and are the most popular amongst gamers. Nvidia Nvidia GPUs tend to have the widest feature set, their ray tracing is better than AMD's, their DLSS, which is their upscaling tech, is better than AMD's, their studio suite of features for streaming and editing is, you guessed it, better than AMD's. Now, with all advantages, there are disadvantages, Nvidia cards tend to be more expensive, and you tend to get less VRAM for your money. Take, for example, an equivalent AMD and Nvidia card. The AMD card, which retailed for $600, had 16 gigabytes of VRAM. The Nvidia card only had 12. And that that's going to be a pattern you'll see across the board. That makes AMD, who are currently the second largest GPU maker, a great choice for those of you less bothered about all of the fancy features you'll get with Nvidia for a lower price. If you're building a system for between $1,200 and $1,600, $1,700, it tends to be AMD that win out as far as my recommendations go. The final option is Intel. Intel currently have their Arc lineup. Now this is more complicated. They're cheaper than the AMD and Nvidia options at their manufacturer suggested retail price prices and they provide really good performance. They're just not as consistent. Some games you're going to see better performance from Arc than others, whereas on Nvidia and AMD card it tends to be a more stable picture. The best bet is to look at benchmarks for your favourite game on the Arc card you want to buy and check that the numbers look A-OK. -okay. If you're shopping on the high end I would go for Nvidia. AMD is currently no match for the RTX 5090 and 5080 within their product stack. You might not like that but it's true. Well those of you shopping in the middle of the market are going to consider AMD or Nvidia. AMD is my preference, their RX 7900 GRE 7800 XT and the new upcoming 9070 and 9070 XT are likely to be the better value mid-range options but you are coming at the sacrifice of features. So you've decided then on your CPU and GPU combo and allocated roughly half of your budget but what about the other parts? What's left? 
Well, in every build, we need two types of storage, long-term storage and short-term storage, otherwise known as your SSD or hard drive and RAM. Storage is a totally personal preference as far as capacity goes, but speed is another question. Gone are the days where you'd build with a slow SATA SSD and instead you want to look at NVMe solutions. Now we're currently up to generation five, which is really, really quick. We're talking up to about 14 gigabytes per second, like rapid quick, but I'd recommend Gen 4 for the vast majority of you guys buying. You can find Gen 4 NVMe drives around about $60 per terabyte. For most builds, I'd recommend a one or two terabyte NVMe, but be aware that the size of games is obviously only ever increasing and that spending a little extra is not a bad idea. As far as RAM or memory is concerned, this is also super easy. You want at least 32 gigabytes. I hate seeing pre-built gaming PCs with 16 gigs or people assembling systems with 16. It really, really winds me up. It's one of the reasons why over on Geek PC, which is our UK PC building company, all of our systems have 32 gigabytes of RAM as standard. Really, really important. The big one with memory though is speed and latency. And this matters more or less depending on the CPU you've chosen. Typically, I like to suggest that you should go for a kit with a 6,000 megahertz speed or mega transfer speed or higher. The lower the latency, the better. I like to sit around the 30, 32 mark. But again, the mileage you're gonna have out of this latency depends on the CPU you've selected. You should be paying around about £100 or $100 for a good 32 gig kit with a 6,000 speed and a fairly low latency. Again, that's an area you can't really cut a great deal of cost. Yes, an RGB kit, for example, is going to cost you more than a non-RGB kit, but you don't want to scrimp when it comes to speed or latency as that is going to be bad news. What other components do we need to look at? Well, now's a great time to pick your power supply because your main power components, your CPU and your GPU, have been selected and that's going to allow you to calculate just how much wattage you actually need. Tools like PC Part Picker are a great place to chuck all of your components in and see estimated power consumption. But don't take this figure alone. Head to the GPU manufacturer's webpage and find out the recommended wattage for your GPU. We'll pop some recommended wattages on your screen now for cards like the 5090, 5080 and AMD RX 7900 series so that you guys can see roughly the kind of power supply wattages the brands recommend. Again, bear in mind, if you've gone for a higher end CPU, you, that is all going to use up power. So make sure you account for that in your calculation. The other big mistake people make with power supplies is going, right, well, the uh, the build on PC Part Picker uses 400 watts. I'll just get a 400 watt power supply. You don't want to do that. You need around 30 to 40% headroom. Again, it all depends on the efficiency of the power supply and the efficiency of your components, but you want a bit of wiggle room at the top. You do not want to go cheap. You can buy a good power supply now for around about $100 for a 750 watt unit, a little higher if you want 850 or 1000 watts. And I'll leave some of my favorite recommendations for each component class down below. So if there's some good power supplies you want to take a look at, you can find them down there. A note with power supplies, try and make sure it's an ATX3 unit with the new 12 volt high power connector, which you're going to need for the vast majority of new mid-range and high-end graphics cards. All that leaves us with then is the case, CPU cooler and motherboard. Let's do the CPU cooler because it's an easy one to tick off the list. We know what CPU we've got, we know how hot it's going to run, and the cooler size is going to determine some of our case choices too. Some budget oriented CPUs like the Ryzen 5 7600 come with a stock cooler, but in my opinion, you shouldn't use one. I'd recommend picking up at least an aftermarket air cooler with a single tower for a Ryzen 5 i5 or Core Ultra 5 CPU. I'd recommend stepping up to a 240, but preferably a 360 mil all-in-one radiator for a Core Ultra 7, Core i7 or Ryzen 7 processor. Well, anything higher than this, you're gonna be into that 420 mil AIO territory. The bigger the radiator, the better the performance tends to be. Again, that's not a guarantee, it's a guideline. But a cool CPU is not only a happy one in the sense that you're going to achieve higher out-of-the-box clock speeds, but it also tends to help with your wider build cooling. A large radiator with lots of fans just improves general airflow too, which is a really nice positive side effect. Now, the motherboard then is the next stage. And again, this is where you can spend an awful lot of money. Some of the cheapest Z890 boards start from around $250, but can range into the well over a thousand dollar mark. What's the difference? Now, as far as gaming performance goes, you're not really gonna see a great deal within a singular motherboard chipset. It's never a good idea to, on that basis, pair a really high-end CPU with the cheapest compatible motherboard. Remember, a high-end CPU needs extra power delivery. And to take advantage of all of the features 
because you'll want a motherboard that gives you great connectivity and expansion for things like your high-speed USB ports, Wi-Fi, wired Ethernet, and expansion for onboard SSDs and, of course, your graphics card. Now, the way that motherboard manufacturers differentiate things is within chipsets. Whenever a new CPU is released, you'll see a few different chipsets at a few different tiers. For AMD, the top-end chipset starts with an X, so it's currently X870 and X870E, but they have a cheaper B850 and B850E chipset too. Intel do similar. Z is their high-end denominator with Z890, but again, they also have a cheaper chipset that starts with the B naming scheme. I would recommend, again, for a Core Ultra 5, i5, or Ryzen 5 tier, going for the B series for Intel and AMD. For your Core Ultra 7s, i7s, Ryzen 7s, and above, typically I'd go for an X or Z series chipset. Gonna give you that better feature match. Now, if gaming is all you're doing and you want to save money, of course you don't need to go for the top-end chipset. But very often, the cheapest boards for the top-end chipset will actually give you lots of features at a price that just won't cost you that much money. It is a different story if you're gonna do video editing, rendering, have lots of devices to plug in, want high-speed ethernet, you're gonna need to check on a motherboard by motherboard basis as to what those features are. How many drive connections has it got? How many randoms has it got? How many PCI expansion slots has it got? But again, for most people, you don't need to overspend here. As with all these things, you can find full reviews of loads of motherboards over on our website. And it's always a good idea to check the reviews of the individual components you're gonna buy, just is a logical thing to do. Now that brings me on to the final stage of the build, which is the case. And this is another one where you can get it really right or really wrong. A PC case stores all of your components and a good PC case makes a massive difference. The first is to cooling. Some cases come with fans, some don't. Some cases have lots of perforated panels for great airflow or loads of glass for wraparound aesthetics. The main thing to be aware of with cases is that they're based off motherboard sizes. So the smallest motherboard size is mini ITX, then to micro ATX and then ATX. You'll also find extended ATX, which is extra large. Typically, most builds are gonna use a standard ATX case design. But if you want a small form factor system, a mini ITX chassis is gonna be the way to go. I've done a video talking about some of my favorite cases of the last year, which you can find in the card section now. The main thing to note is that you don't want a case that constrains cooling. You wanna make sure it fits the height of your CPU air cooler or the length of your CPU liquid cooler radiator. And of course, the length of your GPU. And remember, if you've got the graphics card in the build and the radiator mounted at the front, this will reduce the theoretical GPU support in the chassis. You're also gonna pay more money for a smaller form factor case or smaller form factor build. Why? Because it's a bit more specialist and developing motherboards that cram all the capacitors, connections onto a smaller PCB is a costly exercise. In short, if you wanna keep things simple, a micro ATX or ATX chassis is going to be the better value bet. As I say though, I'll link some of my favorite components from all the categories down below. Hopefully this has helped demystify your PC part selection process and good luck picking the parts for your next build.